Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Firefly Masterclass. My name is Howard Pinsky, Senior Design Evangelist here at Adobe. Hope you're all doing well on this, what is it, Thursday? It's Thursday. It feels like Friday because we have tomorrow off. So excuse me for not knowing what day it is. Also, I'm always locked in the do indoors, so I don't know. I don't know. But I hope you're all, all, all doing well. If you are tuning in live here on Behance today, let me know in the chat who you are and where you're tuning in from. Carol from Blazing Hot, Florida. And then Anika from Toronto. Awesome. Two places I've spent a lot of time. I was born in uh, Toronto, raised there for about 20 some odd years, and then moved to Florida for about five or six years, something like that. Great places. Very different weathers though. All right. So... What we've got going on today? Well, we're gonna dive deep into Adobe Firefly. Now, if you haven't used Firefly yet, I would definitely recommend it. A uh, lot of really cool tools that we're building internally and many have been released already to the public. Still in beta, but you can dive in and check it out. Firefly is our generative AI model. I hate the word AI, it's being used way too often. So I'm, you're not gonna hear me using it very much. Actually, a fun, fun, little bit of a fun fact, if you've watched my Firefly and Generative Fill videos on YouTube, I don't say the word AI once in any of them. It's just not necessary, right? Patrick, great to see you. All right. Uh, Nika saying, didn't know you spent time here. I did. I, was, uh, I lived in Toronto for, I think, I think it was 21 years before I moved to Florida. All right. So let's go ahead and hop over to my screen. Boop, and we're going to get going. So... If you want to dive in and really immerse yourself in the world of Firefly, hey, Andrew, great to see you. Firefly.adobe.com. You'll be taken to this page right here where you can start trying out many of the tools that we have available. So we have text to image, generative fill, text effects, generative recolor. But then we also kind of hint at a few things that we're working on. Now, it's not to say that all of these things will be available, but we're definitely exploring them. We're seeing if they're possible. We're seeing if they make sense, right? 3D to image could be exciting. Extend image, which is available in Photoshop, and you're going to see that in a little bit. And down here, we've got even more. Personalized results, text to vector, text to pattern, text to brush, sketch to image, text to template. It just goes on and on. Hey, Jan, great to see you as well. We've got a lot of tools. A lot available to the public and a lot coming. All right, so let's start off with text to image. Now, if you've watched my streams before, you probably know that I'm not the biggest fan of straight up text to image, but this technology is necessary to power and build a lot of the other tools like generative fill and generative expand and many of the other ones that you're going to see, right? Susan from Maine and Oliver, great to see you as well. So let's start with text to image. And I wanna go over a few different examples, right? Obviously, we start off with some inspiration. We, we've got this cat, it's a yellow, a cat wearing a yellow beanie, sunglasses, eating a hamburger, modeling in a studio. Now I don't see the hamburger here, but you know, that's the thing about these generative models is the language part of it is always getting better, right? So it may not recognize everything you put in there, especially if you put this whole long story but it's going to get better. But some of these examples are really cool. So what can you use text to image for? A lot of things, really. You can use it for pretty much anything. So if you wanted, right down here, maybe you wanna start off with, let's say a pattern, right? Maybe you're on Adobe Stock and you can't find the exact texture that you're looking for. So you might want something like a marble texture, right? Marble texture, and I'm typing it right, hold on, hold on. I was gonna say I'm typing it right down at the bottom, but you can't even see that, can you? Let me move my little face. Where, where's me? Whoop. I'm gonna move myself over here. Hold on. Boop, there we go. Okay, I should be moving in a second. All right, marble texture with blue accents. Let's try that, right? I just pressed return on my keyboard to start the process. It's doing all this generative stuff in the background, whatever it does, and it gives me a pattern, right? And I can click on any of these and cycle through them to see exactly what I'm looking for. And these are really cool, right? Like I mentioned earlier, we're still in beta. So things are still being trained and tweaked and all sorts of things. Um, and while we're in beta, these cannot be used for commercial 
use. Once it comes out of beta, absolutely, but right now you can't. But this is really cool, right? And what's nice about Firefly is that it's very user-friendly. Not only do you have this text field at the bottom, but you also have these options over to the right. So if you're looking for a very specific style, Right now it's set to art, and you're gonna see some of this in a moment, but you can really dive deep into some of the different styles down here. You have uh, movements and themes and materials. So if you wanted something like clay or yarn or metal or whatever it might be, you've got those there. And then color and tone and lighting and composition. You don't really get that with many of the other text to image models. You just get a text field and, you know, good luck, right? So. We can dive in here, we can make some additional changes. Maybe we don't want blue, maybe we want um, black and gold accents. And we press return and it's going to regenerate this image. And then if you want a very specific aspect ratio, like, oh, these are just fantastic, right? Right here at the top right hand corner, it's set to square, but we can choose landscape, portrait, square again, or widescreen. And it's going to regenerate those images in that aspect ratio, which is great. And in a moment, we're given. Come on, you can do it. This is the, this is the fun thing about these, these uh, generative models when you're streaming is you know, if your internet's not too fast or if, you know, if there's a lot of people generating at the same time, it might be a little bit slower. But here we go. We've got some wonderful images just like that, right? So what else can you do? Well, you can make fun and silly things. So if you wanted maybe... Uh, let's say something yarn related, maybe a, a tiger made of yarn or maybe a knitted tiger wearing a leather jacket, right? Why not? Let's see what happens. Now it is set to widescreen, so we probably want something like square or portrait for something like this. So we're going to uh, regenerate that in that new aspect ratio and let's see what happens. Now, what I found personally is that including the, I mean, these are kind of fun, right? Now it is set to art, which could be throwing the style off a little bit, but I mean, this is pretty cool. So let me turn on, let's try photo and see what that happens. But what I found is including the targeted keywords inside of the text prompt, right? You may have saw earlier, if I go down to materials, we do have yarn over here. Now we could use that, but also including it inside of the text prompt helps a lot to kind of push it more in that direction. So that looks pretty cool as a photo. Let's turn off uh, all the content types and see if that helps at all to kind of push us in that direction. A lot of this is, is experimentation. You know, so much of this is brand new and that looks pretty cool, right? And of course you can do any sort of animal. You can do Play-Doh, you can do uh, uh, chocolate, you can do all sorts of different, but look at this. It's got like little fur kind of poking off. It's really cool. Um, but on a slightly more practical level, let's also say, you know, very similar to the texture, let's say you wanted a very specific image, maybe of a, a hamburger. And this kind of shows you how far you can push this. So if you were to just type in something like, now if I type in just like hamburger or cheeseburger, right? Cheeseburger, it's gonna probably tell me it's too short, right? I think it has to be three words, a photo of a cheeseburger. Or you know what, let's do a gourmet cheeseburger, right? We'll start with that. We're gonna start nice and simple. Now, when you start, it's gonna look okay. It's gonna look nothing special, right? These images, they're fine, and they might work for some situations, but they're not great, right? So first thing I would do, I would turn on photo. And that's gonna to start to push this image in a more photorealistic direction. So that's number one. And we're gonna get, okay, right? So we're starting to get there. Now I'm also going to change this to, let's say a landscape photo, because I might be using it as the background on a website or as a product shot, something of that nature. So probably landscape might work a little bit better. So again, we're getting there, but if you take a look at some of the textures, it's just not there yet. So that's where we can really start to push it in a more advanced direction. So we can do something like an editorial style photo of a, a gourmet cheeseburger. So we'll start there and see what that 
kind of looks like. And now we're starting to define the type of photo that we're looking for, right? You can do a studio photo or a product photo or whatever it might be. And we're starting to get slightly higher definition, not, not necessarily resolution, but it's kind of looking a little bit sharper, right? And then we can also start to control and define where this cheeseburger, and I'm sorry if there are any vegans in the chat, but where this cheeseburger is going to be uh, positioned, right? So maybe on a rustic table, and we're gonna see what that looks like. And what's interesting is once you add, start adding additional elements, that starts defining more of the scene, right? So we have a rustic table, which is this one over here. I mean, they're all rustic table, but this one looks really nice, right? And then we might want something, um, maybe it's in a tavern, right? In a tavern something like that. So that's gonna to start to define the background of the photo as well. We're gonna see what that looks like. Ah, right. Okay, we're getting somewhere. And then maybe a dimly lit. Now restaurant's one of those words that I can never spell. Restaurant. Dimly lit restaurant in the background. And let's see what that, starts to bring us. And then if you wanted to, you can start adding some additional keywords. You know, it's, it's up for debate whether or not these additional keywords help, but something like highly detailed or you know, rustic, uh, rustic style. Sometimes they might help, sometimes they may not. Style, right? And then it's gonna kind of keep pushing you towards your final result. And I wish I saved all the, I mean, we can go back, but I wish I saved all the previous ones and downloaded them all. So just so you can kind of see the difference of what they're looking like. And now we have a pretty decent final result. And of course, you know, like many of the other uh, generative models out there, Firefly will continue to get better and better and better. And eventually it's just gonna look like reality. And is anything real? I don't know. Uh, let's go ahead and switch this to widescreen because we might want a wider version of this. But, you know, one thing that we added recently is generative fill. And you, you've probably seen this in Photoshop, but it's also available on the Firefly website. So let's go ahead and actually generative cheese on our word table. Let's say surrounded by fries and uh, what else? Pickles, right? I hate pickles, but we're gonna add this. There's a purpose we're adding these pickles that I don't like. Anika saying, is anything real? I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm over the last few years. I just don't know if anything's real. All right. So we've got some images, right? And you might run into a situation where you really like this image here. It's got the fries. It's got the burger, but it's got these weird looking pickles over here to the right. I don't like pickles. I know some of you do, but I just don't want the pickles, right? So what we can do, we can go up to this button up here, edit, and then go to generative fill. So we can go straight into generative fill on the Firefly website. And what we're able to do now is we're able to paint away those pickles. So we have some options over here, insert, remove, or pan. So let's start with remove. And I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in. I think I can zoom in. Can I not zoom in? No, okay, guess I can't. I think, thought there was a way. But anyways, I can just go ahead and paint over here. Get rid of these pickle looking things. They almost look like olives too, right? and then press remove. And it's going to start that generative fill process. And in a moment, those pickles should be gone. Poof, and it gives us four different options. That one looks pretty good, right? Beautiful, that's it. That's all there is to it. Just paint it away. And you might be asking, you know, what's the difference between generative fill and some like content aware fill, which we have in Photoshop. I'm gonna show you that in just a few moments once we dive into Photoshop. So text effects or text to image, and then generative fill. Let's go back to the Firefly homepage and let's explore very quickly text effects. I haven't been using text effects too much, but they're kind of fun. You know, if you have a situation where you need something like this, definitely go ahead and use it. But you can do something like maybe this gold one or this mossy one, right? I'm gonna start with some inspiration. And all you have to do is type in the word that you wanna generate down here at the bottom left-hand corner, and then the style that you want to uh, use and generate on top of it. And then you're left with something like this. So if you wanted something, you know, boop, and it's gonna regenerate in that mossy look. And you can type in pretty much anything you want. 
let's say popcorn. I'm gonna regenerate that. Nika saying command control plus might work to zoom in the browser. Yeah, it, that probably does, yeah. All right, so we have a few different options for popcorn. It's gonna regenerate as I select these different options. We also have some styles over to the right-hand side. We have um, match shape, so we can make the popcorn a little bit tighter on the letters or a little bit looser. So if you wanted the popcorn to kind of move away, almost exploding, right? You can do something like loose over to the right and it should kind of push it a little bit further away from the text. Then of course you can choose different fonts and background colors and all sorts of fun things down here at the bottom. Again, I don't personally find a need for these text effects too often, uh, but if you do, they are there for you. And then finally, we have generative recolor, which is also available in Illustrator. So if you, if you have a vector image, at the moment on the Firefly website, we use SVGs. So if I hop over to boop, Finder, I've got a few SVGs here and all I have to do is just grab one of them. Let's say, I don't know, this one's kind of fun. Pop it in here. And I can describe the color palette I want to use. Let's say, uh, pastel tones, we'll see if this works. And in a moment, we're given some different options for our SVG. And because it's vector, all of this is also vector, right? So we can re-download this SVG, use it on our websites, enlarge it, shrink it, whatever we need. And we also have some sample prompts over to the right as well. Trippy disco lights is always fun, right? And then some more neutral ones like salmon sushi, which sounds delicious, honestly. I can go for some, I haven't had sushi in a while. I'm gonna go for some sushi today, maybe. Actually, maybe tomorrow, I'm off tomorrow, right? So we have some different fun results. But like I mentioned, it's also available in Illustrator. So if I do hop over to Illustrator, we have an Illustrator file. So it doesn't have to be an SVG in Illustrator. It can be a standard Illustrator file. And we've got two over here. And you know, this one here has a few different elements to it. We've got these uh, people in this robot thing in the foreground. We've got a background and some textures, right? So we can, we don't have to select the entire image. We can, of course, but we can select just this bit of it. And then under the edit menu, go down to edit colors and then generative recolor. Again, also available in beta. And then we can choose a prompt up here at the top, or we can choose one of the presets. So let's go, I don't know, summer by the sea. Yep, everything's in beta. And then we've got a few different options and we can just cycle between. And because all of this is vector, it's all layered. Everything is, all the colors are being applied directly to those layers, which is amazing, right? Let's go back to the trippy disco. They're kind of fun, right? Gives a nice vibrant pop to your images. Then you can select the background separately and then recolor. And maybe I'll want, let's, you know, let's do the trippy disco again. And it just gives your images a whole different vibe. Now you can select the entire thing, right? So if I go over here and maybe select this entire, uh, you know, layer over here or a group of layers and then recolor, generative recolor one more time, maybe a dark blue. Interesting, right? Ooh, that one's kind of fun, right? Very simple, but Howard out there making us hungry this morning. I'm making myself hungry. I didn't really eat much today. Oh, this one's fun. Got a little bit of a toned down effect, but it looks really nice. So if I, um, I can undo and go back to the beginning. So that's what we started with, right? And then we can go through all these different um, options. And then we've got our new result, which is really nice. All right, so that was Illustrator. Let me hop over back to the browser for a second. And if you're wondering where you can find SVGs or uh, AI files, if you go to stock.adobe.com, you can find some here. So we have a vector section right here at the top, and this will allow you to browse uh, different vectors, different categories. But if you don't have any credits, you can also go to the free section, and we do have some free uh, vectors. So right down here at the bottom, we've got some free vectors you can browse. There are 500,000 free vectors. Now, obviously some of these, like you know, these black and white ones, are probably not gonna work for generative recolor, but there are some illustrations that you can browse um, you can probably just type in at the top here and browse it, download it for free, try it out in Illustrator. Now, if you want to try it out on the Firefly website, you'll, you will need an SVG. So you can either export it from Illustrator, convert it, or um, you know, find an SVG and use it that way. All right, the last thing I wanna show you in the browser before we hop over to Photoshop and have some fun 
is Adobe Express. Now we are currently in, there's a new beta for Adobe Express and you can go back to the previous version if you want, but new.express.adobe.com, a lot of dots in there. Um, and I use Express all the time for, you know, social media posts and very slight video edits. And there's also inside of the Creative Cloud desktop app, there is, where is it? I know it's here somewhere, quick actions, there it is rearrange the sidebar a little bit. I think you all have this version, but there's some quick actions. So you can, uh, you know, do some of these express actions directly in your creative cloud app as well. But what I want to show you is directly in Adobe express. Now we have text image and text effects. Now I'm not going to go through this whole process again, because it's basically what you saw on the firefly website, but it's also built into the flow of your express workflows, right? So if I was creating, let's say an Instagram square post, for example, and of course this works on non-square posts as well, but we might want, I don't know what I just said. We might want, um, you know, this one over here, maybe we're creating a post for apparel or whatever it might be, right? So we've got something that looks like this and we can go ahead and change the text. What, what's the date? August 10th. So let's go ahead and change this. Things are still loading in the background. Um, August, maybe closes tomorrow, right? 11th. And everything looks pretty good, but the background, it, it's fine, right? It's not, not the best. Now we do have this background here. Let me actually hide this layer here. All right, let me actually move it behind. Where's that background? There's the background. So what I want to do is actually extract the background. So let's move this background up for a second. There we go. And do I have it selected? I might have it, there we go, okay. Uh, I wanna remove the background. So right over here to the left, I'm gonna press remove background. It's gonna cut out the subject from the background. Perfect. And now what I wanna do is go over to uh, elements. And I want to, where did it go? This is the thing with betas, things move around a lot. Uh, da, 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 da. Where did it go? I know it's here somewhere. Generative fill, where did uh, the um, text image, where did it go? I lost it. Somebody in the chat's going to scream at me because backgrounds maybe? No, where did it go? Templates? Well, this is fun. It j it, it's not there anymore. I swear it was there. I was using it this morning and it was there. Maybe it's in media. It's gotta be in media, right? There it is, text to image. I knew it was there. I, I totally knew it was there. All right, so we might want like a, a brick wall with rainbow graffiti. I did not spell that right, did I? There we go. All right, we're gonna change this to something like maybe photo and then generate. Sean's yelling, media. I knew that. I totally knew that. I was testing you, Sean. Uh, that's fun, right? They're gonna resize that, move it behind. Let's move all these things behind. There we go. And now we have our new brick. Now, of course, we might have to change the text and we might have to change a bunch of different things, but if you're looking for a very specific background for your post, you can very easily do that. So this might be, you know, I'm gonna change this to white, for example. Eh, it's a little bit, Accessibility wise just doesn't work, right? Um, so what I'd probably do is either regenerate the background or maybe drop the opacity, add a black overlay on top of it, um, all sorts of different things, right? But let's maybe, maybe a dark, dark brick wall. Think that's gonna work? I don't know, we're gonna see. The words say we're closed, but the picture says we're open. It does, doesn't it? That's the, that's the importance of, uh, proofreading your work before you post it. Um, so this might be, why would this say, why would the template say closed anyway? Oh, it says we're closed until, oh, I see. We're closed until, I get it. But you know what? Yeah, I'm gonna put open. It just makes more sense. But anyways, you get the idea, right? So if you need a new background, if you need an asset, a very small asset or whatever it might be, you can very easily dive into Express as you're working. Under the media tab, which I totally knew, uh, you'll be able to access text to image and generate whatever you need. All right.
So let's go ahead and hop over to Photoshop because that's where personally I'm very excited about. Um, now, if you don't have the Photoshop beta and all of these generative fill technologies and tools are available in the beta, hop over to your apps section within the Creative Cloud desktop app, scroll down to beta, and then you'll be able to download the Photoshop beta. And then when you open it, or you open any image, we can see the generative fill technology. So down here at the bottom, we've got our taskbar. And this, what I love about the taskbar is that change is based on what you're doing, right? So if you go ahead and, you know, select an object like this, you're going to notice that the taskbar has changed and generative fill appears on it. Now, what I want to do first is I want to highlight one of the tools that I use all the time in Photoshop, and that is the object selection tool. So right over here to the left hand side, we've got our object selection tool. And this, what it's going to do is going to start detecting the various objects inside of this image. And I can just hover over any of them and click to select. Now, usually when I'm going to be removing an object, uh, I like to expand it a little bit. Instead of going up to select and then modify and then finding expand, all of that's built directly into the taskbar. So right over here, we can go ahead and click on that and then expand it. Let's expand it maybe about 10 pixels. Now, earlier I was talking about content aware fill versus generative fill, what the difference is. Because you know, I've seen a lot of questions. It's basically the same thing, but it's not. Um, so content aware fill, if you go up to the top, you go to edit and then content aware fill, right? This brings us into the content aware fill experience. Um, you can, you can just run content aware fill as well. Uh, but if you want to slightly better results, you can go into this experience here and you have a bunch of settings over here to the right. You can choose what is sampled and what is not sampled. But as you can see, the results just aren't great. And that's the same thing. If you go to edit and then fill and then content aware, you press OK. You've got this jumbled mess back here. Because content aware fill, even though it is an AI tool, it's it's not intelligent. It's certainly not as intelligent as a lot of the tools these days, right? So essentially what content aware fill is doing, as far as I understand, is when you have a selection, it's looking around your object. Basically, you know, it's probably creating a little bit of a border around it. And it's looking at all the different pixels, it's looking at the color, the shading, the lighting, that sort of thing. And then it's using that information to fill in the subject. So in this case, it's this runner in the background, right? But because it's not intelligent, it doesn't understand the rest of the image. It doesn't understand that this is a light pole. It doesn't understand that this is a fence. It's kind of looking just in that general area. Now with content, with, with generative fill, it's understanding everything, which is kind of scary, but it's also very brilliant, right? So when I go to generative fill, I can either enter something in here that I want to replace this object with. I keep saying object, it's, it's a person. Um, I can replace it with a person, right? Or I can replace it with whatever I want. But if I just press generate, it's gonna start the process of removing this person. And it's not just looking around and looking at the little pixels around it. It's looking at the image. It's understanding that there's a light pole behind this person. It's understanding that there's a fence that goes into the background. And look at that, right? If I turn this off and then back on, it looks like it's, it's really weird. It's really kind of tripping me out. It looks like this person was added after the fact because it's so perfect. You know, this building in the background is moving down perfectly. The fence is moving into the background and ha it has perspective. It's added the bit at the bottom of the light pole. And of course, it's given us a few different options. So if you wanted something slightly different, right? It's really strange. It's recreated the shadows down at the bottom. It's wild. This tech is wild. And this is the stuff that I'm excited about. Not necessarily the text to image. It's the tools that are built into Photoshop that allow you to work faster but also a lot more efficiently, right? Because we could have done this with content aware fill previously, but it just wouldn't have been perfect. And then we'd have to go in and make some changes afterwards and fix all the mess. But yeah, as Reverb Mike says, easy peasy lemon squeezy indeed. So let's look at another example. This one here, you may have seen this in one of my videos on YouTube, but we may want, you know, we've got this image of 
a bowl of fruits, but maybe you're a photographer and you've shot this image. And then afterwards, either the model comes to you or the scope of the project changes and she needs to be eating ice cream for some reason, or you just want a few different variations of this, this uh, particular scene, right? So I'm gonna grab my lasso tool. We're gonna make a very rough selection. I'm also gonna include the fork. And we're gonna do that and boom. We've got our selection, right? Now, we're gonna hop into generative fill, and instead of just generating to remove, which I'd be curious to see what happens, but we're gonna go ahead and type out something like ice cream with a cherry on top. And it's going to generate what I typed into that box. We wanted Fruit Loops. I don't think Fruit Loops in particular would work because it's a trademarked word, or I think, but, um, Something along those lines, cereal might work, for example. Uh, but we've got a few different options for ice cream. Now the bowl got a little bit wonky there, probably because my selection was a little bit strange. Let's go ahead and redo that. Let's just do ice cream, see what happens there. But in many cases, it's going to recognize that it's not only ice cream, but that it should be eaten with a spoon. Because I, I suppose you can eat ice cream with a fork, right? Um, but it's going to change the fork to a spoon. And that's kind of where it really gets intelligent. Now, in some cases, some of the results are looking a little bit funky, but eventually you'll get there, right? Um, and that's the thing about this technology, it's always gonna get better and better and better. Um, so you might have some funky results now, but it's go definitely going to uh, improve over time. And, if, and as you saw in my video on YouTube, um, you can get some really interesting results if you continue to kind of work it in the right direction. Now this cup over here, we might want maybe coffee, right? So I'm gonna grab my rectangular marquee tool and just type out coffee. And we'll see what that gives us. And I love the fact that it gives us a few different results. Um, so we can kind of cycle between them. So we're not just limited to one. So we have that one there. That one's pretty good. That one's decent as well. I think we're gonna stick with this one. There we go. Jan is asking, it might be interesting to know when and why you do generative fill in Photoshop versus generative fill in Firefly. So for me personally, uh, I'm always, always in Photoshop just because that's, it's very natural for me. I've been using it for, I don't know, a million and a half years. Um, so I'm just, it's just always open. So whenever I have an image that I want to edit, I just pop it into Photoshop. But uh, the nice thing about Firefly is that it's super convenient. You don't have to have Photoshop open. You don't even have to have Photoshop at all installed on your computer. Firefly.adobe.com and just generate fill over there. So for convenience wise, that is definitely a, a good option. Um, now, just sticking with this image for one more second, I wanna show you, assuming this works, it should work. But you know, in the background here, we might want maybe a bowl of fruits. Now you might be thinking, if you've never seen this before, that it's gonna generate a very sharp in-focus bowl of fruits. And sometimes it might, but because it's very intelligent and it's analyzing the scene back there, see, this one's a little bit better. See, sometimes it'll generate something that you don't want. And in that case, you can definitely report it, uh, rate, rate it good, poor, whatever. But this one over here, you can see that it's blurred. So it's, it's trying its best to match the blur in the background. So you don't necessarily have to go back later on and apply a blur you can very easily just move on with your life, right? Now, in some cases, you know, the blur might be not, not be as strong as you want. So you can either regenerate again and see what it gives you, or what you can do is just go into, let's say, um, one of your filters, Gaussian blur, for example, and generate that way. So let's see what it gives us this time. It's gonna give us three new results that we can look through, and that looks pretty good, right? And that one, in my opinion, looking at this now, match the blur of the sink and then this, whatever this is, salt and pepper possibly, maybe it's cereal, maybe it's the cereal that uh, I think it was, was it Reaver, uh, Sean was asking, maybe? No, Reaver Mike was asking earlier, maybe that's the cereal. Um, but yeah, that one looks pretty good, right? And it definitely matched that blur in the background. So it's very intelligent in that way. All right. Let's move on to this example here. And this is a big one. Um, this one kind of blew me away when I was experimenting with it because I've been in this situation before where you're on vacation, you get someone to take a photo of you and your significant other or just you, and there's all these people in the background. Now, 
someone pointed out on LinkedIn when I posted this example, they're like, that's, that's the beauty of this photo is that there are people all around it. And I totally get that. But in some cases, you just want those people gone, right? So I'm going to grab my lasso tool and I'm going to make a selection. I'm going to select all these people as best as possible. It doesn't have to be a very good selection. I'm going to keep some of the pigeons because, you know, why not? The pigeons didn't choose to be there. I guess they kind of did, right? So I'm going to just make a selection around these people. I'm going to hold down my shift key on my keyboard to continue the selection over on the right hand side. Again, doesn't have to be fancy, but I'm just including as much information as possible. I'm also kind of trying to hug the subjects in the background a little bit so that Photoshop has a little bit more information, including, you know, these arches and these poles and whatever these things are, right? And I'm going to go generate fill and simply generate. I'm not going to type anything in. I could, I can type remove or I can type uh, architecture, whatever it might be, but usually generate is just enough. And in just a moment, we're going to see the people disappear. And again, it gives us a few different options. Some of them have more pigeons that we can, uh, you know, add into our photo, which is great. And if you take a look, Photoshop didn't have a lot of information to work with, including, you know, when it came to those um, arches at the bottom of the image, right? But it recreated a lot of them and it gives us a few different options. And he's saying, or he, uh, you want to use it commercially and maybe there's a child in it. Maybe that's right. So a lot of real world situations where generative fill comes into play. Um, you know, there have been many times where you take a photo and it looks great, but there are children or teenagers in the photo. You probably don't want to include them, right? So you can remove them. You can use generative fill to change their face a little bit, uh, blur them, whatever it might be. But a lot of real world scenarios for this sort of technology. Um, so we've gone ahead and removed them. But maybe just to see what would happen, we want to regenerate this with pigeons. I might regret this, but let's see what happens. But you can, you know, go back and regenerate with different keywords. So even if you made a generation, hey, Bruce, uh, with nothing, you can always go back and add something in later on. Yeah, some of the, I mean, it did definitely added some pigeons in the background. Uh, it's probably not exactly what I wanted, right? So I'd probably go, you know, back to something like this. Um, you can also enter in, you know, a prompt. Let's, let's say there was nothing there in the first place. You can do something like tourists. I don't know if this is going to work very well. And generating people, it's just not the best experience at the moment. Those will definitely get better over time. But we're going to see what happens. I like, um, I like experimenting a little bit. Anywhere when this might be available out of beta so we can use commercially. I think the the answer that I've heard is as fast as humanly possible, right? Doesn't mean tomorrow, but um, obviously the team is working very hard behind the scenes to get all the legalities and get it, the, you know, the training model in finished and blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of moving pieces, but um, hopefully soon, right? So there you go. If you want to add tourists, you can certainly do that. If you want to remove tourists, you can do that. Now, speaking of another real world example, let's go to this one here. I posted this on Twitter and LinkedIn uh, a few days ago, and you might have an old photo that you found somewhere and you want to retouch it. Now, there's a lot of different ways to do this in Photoshop. People have been doing it for ages, as long as Photoshop's been available. And, you know, recently we added in, if you go up to the neural filters under the filter menu, Recently, we added in the photo restoration neuro filter. I can turn that on. It's going to process. This one processes on device, so it's not connected to the cloud or anything. And, you know, it restored the photo a little bit, but we can also crank up scratch reduction. And then it's going to detect some of the scratches. And it's going to do its best. It does take a little bit of time, but it's going to do its best to remove some of those scratches, right? And it, it, it does a pretty good job, right? If we turn on, you know, I think the, the photo enhancement is probably a little bit too much, but if we turn, see the original and then the new one, it detected a lot of scratches and it removed a bunch of scratches, but it still obviously has all this, you know, the paper tears and these blotches here that we probably want removed a little bit better. So generative fill can definitely help with something like that. So let me go ahead and I'm going to grab my lasso tool and I'm going to just start making a selection. 
This guy looks mad that we took his Fruit Loops <laughs> cereal. I see what you did there. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and make a selection. Right. And I'm going to make a selection here. And you don't, you're not limited. Let me actually just move this. Let me move it up here. And I'm going to pin it into place. Boop. Um, you're not limited to just one, right? Just like I showed you in the tourist example. I can hold down my shift key and just go bananas, right? I'm going to select all this information here. I'm going to leave a little bit of like the coat, for example. Uh, I think I ran into a... There we go. Select some of this. I guess I'm ending up selecting a lot more than I originally wanted to. Whoops. Where am I going? This is why you should probably zoom out. There we go. Okay. Let's move this. Move this out of the way. Let me start again. These selections are, um, they're complex because you also want to include some of the coat in the background, right? So that Photoshop kind of sees some of that, to try to recreate it. So let's go again and select this information here. And what we can do, oh, I didn't zoom out again. I'm, I'm failing at my job today, aren't I? So I'm gonna select this here. Okay, I got, got most of it. And also select this blotch here, right? And then maybe this one over here. We've got some over here. There we go. Hopefully there's music in the, hopefully the music's working so you don't have to just hear silence all the time. And then over here, we're gonna go around like this. Make sure to keep some of this area here. Go up. And then, there we go. All right, so we've got a bunch of selections. Now we can go in, like I mentioned earlier, you know, to give Photoshop a little bit more to work with, we can deselect some of this area here, part of this coat. But let's see what happens if we just have this selection, press generative fill, and then generate. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, don't need to enter anything when you're trying to remove. Can't hear the music. Oh, no. I guess the music is not working. Oh, it looks like it's not turned on on my Wirecast. Hmm. Next time I'll make sure it works. But there we go, right? Before and after. That is fancy. And again, we, we have a few different options. We may not necessarily need all the different options, but it gives us a few options for the coat and the arm and that sort of thing. But this one looks pretty good, right? And then for the smaller areas, then you can use something like, if we hop into our healing tools, like our spot healing brush. Like, whoops, on the wrong layer. That would help, right? Right, we probably don't need, and also create a new layer on top. Make sure sample all layers is turned on. We don't need anything too advanced for these smaller areas. Bruce is asking, does it help to select everything in the first try? Uh, sometimes, but sometimes it actually hurts to select everything because you are, you're kind of limiting the information that Photoshop is using to make the repair in this case. Um, so sometimes selecting smaller chunks and also because of, because generative fill, I think the, the resolution in Photoshop is somewhere around like 1200 by 1200. If you're working with a much larger image and you make a massive selection, then you might get a little bit of blurriness or low resolution for the result. So if you do it in smaller chunks, then you're gonna probably get much better results in my opinion. Um, but definitely experiment and see what works best. Yeah, so the spot healing brush, you can just go around and make some smaller changes or you could have include, included some of these areas um, with the actual photo. Now, again, this is personal preference, right? Um, a lot of people might like this particular result or the original, right? Because it looks authentic, it looks old. Um, but some people just wanna restore their old photos and see what it might've looked like when it was originally taken. So having the different options for both is interesting, right? It's definitely things to, um, consider as you're making these edits. All right, moving on. Generative expand, right? Uh, we added this, what was it last week or the week before? Time, time is weird, time wobbly, timey-wimey, wobbly things. Um, we added this not too long ago, 
And it's just an easier process of expanding an image. So previously, what you had to do is you had to grab your crop tool and you had to extend an image. Maybe I want to extend it all the way out this way, right? And, you know, we've got our fill set to background. Now, if we were to set it to content aware fill, which is the old way of doing things, we're going to get this. It's not great, right? So now, if you go ahead and extend the image, before we added generative expand, we were to just create a simple background, simple crop, right? Then grab our rectangular marquee tool, make a selection on the left, make a selection on the right, and then generative fill, which wasn't the worst thing in the world. But now we have generative expand. We have it on the top on our options bar. We also have it on the task bar at the bottom. So I can go ahead and hit that. Don't have to enter anything in because I just wanted to do its thing. And in just a few moments, it's going to go through the process and it's going to give us our expanded image. And every time I see this, I just get blown away at how intelligent this actually is because it's recreating and giving us a few different options. Now, that one's not great. I would probably report that one. But, you know, that one's pretty good. It's even added a little leaf in the foreground, but it's recreated this animal. Tiger, leopard, cheetah, jaguar thing. I don't know what it's called. Um, I think I did this last time in one of my other streams. But it's recreating this. It, like this information didn't exist before. It's it's literally hallucinating this new animal, which is absolutely wild, right? And it doesn't just work with animals, obviously. Um, big use case is landscape. So you're on a family vacation or end of vacation, whatever it might be, and you know we've all got our phones, right? We take a photo vertically because it's just the natural thing to do with phones these days, and you might want a horizontal version of it. So I'm going to go ahead and hop into uh, my crop. We do have some ratio presets at the bottom. So we might want, I don't know, two by three and five by six. Now these are mostly vertical. So I'm going to just go ahead and just extend this outwards and then leave this blank and press generate. And it's going to start the process. It's going to recreate the mountains and the water and who knows what else. Maybe it'll add a shark. I don't know. Possibly. Probably not though. And there we go, right? And it's giving us a few different options again, like I mentioned earlier. But we've just taken a more or less vertical image and then extended it out horizontally. So now we can share it on other platforms that are not vertical based, right? Um, so if, if you want one for your story and one for your, uh, you know, Instagram reel or your feed, right? You can very easily do that, which is wonderful. All right. Now this example here. You might think that we're going to extend this out, and we certainly could. But one tip that I saw, I think it was from Blue Lightning TV not too long ago, is about converting photos into paintings using generative fill. Now you might think, right? You can just, you know, generative fill, select everything, generative fill, and then type out oil painting. But it's not gonna work that way. Right. What it's going to do is going to regenerate. It's going to generate a brand new oil painting on top of this image and essentially replace it. And you're going to see that in a second. That's certainly not what we want. Like we could use this texture and use a, a blend mode, for example, and kind of get something kind of, but that's not really what we want. We want to use the original pixels or at least some of the original pixels of this particular image to generate the oil painting. So let me let me see if I remember this correctly because it's not as easy as you might think. So we're gonna hop into quick mask mode. I think it was, no, it was channels, I think. And then we're going to create a new channel. And then what we want to do here is we want to, I think quick mask mode also works, but we want to fill this channel with a color. So we have basically a range from 100% down to 0%. We want it somewhere in like the 40% range so the brightness right down here, one about 40% brightness, right? So we're going to fill that with, so we're going to set that and we're going to fill this canvas with about 40% brightness. So we're going to go to edit and then fill and then foreground color, which you can also do with your uh, op alter option backspace uh, shortcut, right? Uh, oh, can't see behind. Oh, no. It's, it, it. let me see if I can move myself a little bit more. There we go. So basically back here, just a single single channel, new channel, right? And then I filled that channel with 40% uh, brightness. 
as you saw, hopefully saw that one. And what we want to do is want to make a selection of this channel. So I'm going to hold down my commander control key and click. Now, because it's less than 50%, it's going to give me this warning. No pixels are more than 50% selected. That's fine. That's totally fine. What it's letting you know is that because we had 40% brightness, it's actually selecting kind of like 40% of the pixels. A little bit difficult to explain. But if we go back to RGB now, we still have our selection, even though we can't see the selection, right? We're gonna go to generative fill and type out oil painting, and we're gonna press generate. And now it's going through the process one more time, but it's using 40% of the pixels of our original image to create this oil painting. And if all went well, if I remember this process, we should be left with an oil painting of our original image, right? And we have a few different options we can cycle between. And that one looks pretty good, right? There's the before and there's the after. So if you're looking to do image to painting, that's definitely a way. Maybe we'll make it easier in the future, possibly. If anyone, if any of the engineers are watching, let's make this, <laughs> let's make this easier, right? Uh, there's gotta be a way with the, the, uh, the task bar. Maybe if we like have a, a, a checkbox or something to include the pixels of the, I don't know. I'm just brainstorming, but definitely uh, an option. And we can dive in here if you wanted a watercolor painting. And it's still going to use the selection, right? The 40% of the original image to create this new watercolor painting. And in a second, we're going to be left with watercolor. Now, this mountain up here kind of is floating away for some reason. But that one looks pretty good, right? So we've got our watercolor and we've got our oil painting. I'm sure there's many other styles we can apply this to, but definitely a pro tip. A little bit more advanced than um, I would like, so maybe eventually it'll be easier, but there you go. Um, and then we're back to the beginning. Now, one more, two more, two more examples before we wrap things up. Um, I know a lot of you, you, know, you like text to image, but you like to use other uh, text to image services, or you've just grabbed a stock image somewhere and uh, you want to make some changes to it. So I showed this off, uh, I think it was yesterday, but we can just start selecting uh, some of the random, you know, pickles again, right? Don't want those. Select those. I'm just holding on my shift key. I can grab my lasso tool, make some additional changes. Maybe I'll expand this a little bit. Let's try 10 and then generate a fill and generate. So it's incredibly simple to just grab an image bring into Photoshop or Firefly on the web, use generative fill just to remove objects or even add objects if you want to. Um, and there you go. Now, occasionally you might get this warning at the top. In this case, you don't have to worry too much about it. Um, but it probably detected something that was a little bit risky for some reason. Um, but back here, we have this goop. I don't know what this goop exactly is, but we might want to replace that with maybe ketchup, right? So generative fill, ketchup, and I completely spelled that incorrectly. So I'm curious, yeah, it did ketchup, that's a bit better. Um, and then in a second, it should replace this with ketchup. Then I do wanna show you one more pro tip right after this. And there we go, oops. We've got our ketchup. A few different options, that one looks pretty good. All right, so one more. Example, and this one is kind of fun. Videos. Got this video that I downloaded from Adobe Stock. It's a stationary video, so the camera doesn't move. That's very important, right? Um, so it's not gonna work in all cases, but you can open this directly in Photoshop. So I've opened this video in Photoshop. It's loading, there we go. Timeline popped up at the bottom. And we might want to crop this or extend this for Instagram Reel, right? You can't really post this on Instagram. Um, so if I go ahead and go to Crop, now this one I'm not gonna use Generative Expand. I mean, we, I suppose we could, right? If we go outside of here. Um, I'm gonna set this to Instagram. I have a preset save, which is essentially nine by 16, right? Now we could just crop it like this and call it a day, right? But we might want it a little bit larger. So I'm gonna expand it maybe in both directions. Just like that, and then go. And it's going to create, it's gonna generate the surrounding area of that stationary video. Again, it has to be stationary because Photoshop doesn't do motion tracking or anything like that, but it gives us a few different options. 
And then we can extend this down here at the bottom in the timeline. And then we can go ahead and play. And now we have an extended video. Pretty simple, right? Again, yes, it has to be stationary. Um, and the things on the sides where you're extending can't have any motion. But in those situations, it's pretty cool and it works. All right, that's gonna wrap things up for me for today. Big thank you to everyone who has tuned in. Definitely dive into Firefly, test it out, use all the different tools, let us know how, what you think and stick around. We've got more content coming up in just a few moments and I will see you all next time.